Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this morning's script reading comes from 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. So much this morning for you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Now I can imagine some of you are wondering, Pastor Troy, what are you up to? <laughs> You had us read this same passage for three Sundays in a row. Well, I am up to something. And uh, I wanted us to really hear that more than one Sunday. And also the last two Sundays, I wanted to flash back to the life and times of Peter to remind you what he had gone through in his journey with Christ. You know, he was full of faults and fears and failures like the rest of us. And Peter is an example to us of someone struggling to walk with Christ. And so I, re I reviewed some of his life story to let you know where he had come from with his walk with Christ and what he was called to as the rock of the church and the apostle to the church. And now it was really years later, it was 30 years later towards the end of his life that he's writing this letter. And so now Peter's very seasoned, he's learned a lot, and he's really, selling, he's really telling us some very striking and powerful things that we need to hear. They needed to hear them then, we need to hear them now. And today we're going to talk about the same thing Peter mentions here at the top of the letter, which is we're strangers in this world. And before we begin, let me say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I, I think it's such a humble thing, a powerful thing, a wonderful thing to look at your word in our language and we can read it and understand it and hear the voice of the Apostle Peter and really hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. He was the one using Peter to write this letter. This letter was so relevant for the believers back then and it's especially relevant for the believers today. And I pray that you'll help me to communicate these things and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll see the bulletin this morning, you'll see that the title is Strangers in the World. And I thought that was a great photo that Beth and I discovered and put there. You know, uh, if you look at the photo, you can see that, you know, there's a crowd coming and going, milling about in this heart of the city. But if you notice, there's kind of a dark shadow cast on them and on the city street and on the town. And this is what Peter is talking about with us this morning, is he's conveying to the believers that he visited around the Roman Empire, around the Mediterranean Sea, as he made his way from Jerusalem all the way around to Rome, to the capital of Rome, the Roman Empire. He writes this letter back to all those churches he just visited. He wants to encourage them in their faith. He sees what the world's like. He sees what their lifestyle and their following Christ is like. And he knows there's a distinct difference. And so at the top of this letter, he lets them know that 
that they are elected by God. God has chosen them, but that makes them strangers in the world. Strangers in the world. The towns that Tom read about and the other readers these past couple weeks, these other towns and, and cities were the ones that Paul, that Peter had traveled through, where there were believers in all these towns and cities as he made his way from Jerusalem to Rome. And so he writes back to them, the, the believers, those God has elected, who I just visited on my way here, those in Pontus, those in Galatia, those in Cappadocia, those in Asia, those in Bithynia, who have been chosen, who have been elected. I'm speaking to God's people and wherever you find yourself. He would say today, those who are in Romeoville, those who are in Lockport, those who are in Plainfield, right? That's you and me. Often as Christians, we read a letter like this and think, well, it was back then, it was them, it was Peter, you know. No, it's you, it's us, it's now. We are strangers in this world. We are aliens, we are exiles scattered throughout the world because we belong to a different kingdom. You know, that's why he calls them aliens, exiles, scattered. Because the people he visited had been scattered from Jerusalem. He was visiting old Jewish friends. He was visiting Gentile believers who had come to faith. The reason he knows this is because 30 years earlier, when they crucified Christ in the heart of Jerusalem, the Jewish nation was in an uproar. They despised Jesus. They not only wanted to kill him, but they wanted to kill him slowly. That's what the crucifixion is about, by the way. The Persians developed it, the Romans made it even worse because they hate you so bad as an enemy, they just don't want to kill you. They want to kill you slowly. And that's what they did to Jesus. And that's what they wanted to do with his followers. That's why his followers scattered. That's why Peter and the men were hiding up in the room. That's why Peter was as scared to admit that he knew Christ in the courtyard of Caiaphas when the little servant girl said, hey, aren't you a follower of Jesus? No, don't know the man. Why would big, strong, solid rock Peter cave in? Because he was scared. That's why. And because of that fear and that persecution, people started to leave Jerusalem. They can't handle the oppressive religious system of the Pharisees anymore. Those guys, they drive me crazy. And they hate Jesus. They hate his followers. I became a believer. You know, thousands and thousands of people became a believer in the kingdom. And in Jesus is the Messiah. All those people he healed, all those blind men, lame men, leper men, demon possessed people, they all believe in Jesus. And now they're on the wanted list. And they're scattering. And so they went to other towns. So three decades later, Peter's 60 something year old. He's an old fisherman now, but he is an on fire apostle. <laughs> And you know, he stayed in Jerusalem, and he stayed in Judea, and he reached out to the Gentiles. You know, he was the one that went to the house of Cornelius and saw the Holy Spirit come to Gentiles so they might be saved. Someone's car is going off. And so Peter was reaching people in his area, but he always wanted to go to Rome. He always wanted to travel the routes that Paul traveled. See, Paul had already been on three missionary journeys, planting all these churches, seeing all these people come to know Christ, making all these disciples. Peter heard about it, and he always wanted to go. Matter of fact, he heard that Paul made the trip again, and he's in Rome now. So Peter says, I'm going to Rome, and he makes the journey. Probably took a couple of weeks, if not a couple months. Along the way, he meets with all these churches. All these people, just like you and me. And all these different towns that he mentions. And they were struggling in their faith, struggling in their identity as a Christian, in the culture in which they found themselves, and struggling for persecution. A persecution had waned a little bit, but it was about to hit the fan a couple years later. The year is 63 to 64 AD. Peter finally makes it to Rome. Paul's already there. They spend the next two or three years there. Eventually, 
Paul ends up under house arrest. Uh, but Paul is writing letters and ministering to people. Peter's made it there. He's ministering to people. He wants to see if there's actually Christians in Rome. It's like going to Las Vegas. There are actually Christians in Las Vegas. <laughs> Whatever decadent pagan place you can think of. I went to Vegas once back in the 80s. Horrible, horrible place. Oh, I know they've glamorized it now. And they're wanting families to come. But it's all about gambling, prostitution, and pagan entertainment. So Peter goes to Rome. Matter of fact, at the very tail end of the letter, he says, And all the believers here and myself send you our greeting from Babylon. That was the code word the apostles gave to Rome, because Rome was as bad as Babylon. But they didn't want anyone to know that they were there. So they said Babylon. It's really kind of interesting. So Peter's there, and he says, I need to write a letter. He's motivated by the Holy Spirit. I need to write a letter, and I need to encourage all those faces, all those followers of Jesus that I met in all those different towns, and encourage them in their identity of Christ. And you know what? God, Jesus, Peter, the Holy Spirit would want us to be encouraged in our identity in Jesus Christ, who we are as Christians in this world. And the very first thing Peter starts off with is, you are elect, you are chosen out of this dark world. You are elected by God and you are strangers scattered throughout the world. Now, the Holy Spirit and Peter are kind of playing off an idea. These people had literally been scattered because of persecution. But he wants them to know that you're also strangers in this world. Strangers in this world. I thought of a story this week where I was thinking about this idea of being a stranger in the world. We should feel that way as Christians. You know, I've been on the journey with Jesus Christ now for 35 years. And it's been a journey of mountains and valleys and meadows and dead ends and mountain tops. But in these recent years, as I've gotten serious with the Lord, my commitment and my service to Him, I feel more and more out of place in this world. And I feel more and more like I am truly looking forward to the return of Christ. I'm feeling more like an apostle. That's how they felt. That's what they wrote about. You know, we don't belong to this world and we are longing for the return of Jesus Christ. And I feel like a stranger and I'm under persecution. I don't belong here. You start to get that feeling as you grow as a Christian. You, you need to. You should. Because we don't belong here. I thought of when I felt very much like this. Um, and I'm going to again tell a story about myself. You know, I, I realize that Paul told stories about himself, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> you know, Paul would say, I was the worst Christian. I persecuted the church. I, I am all of the apostles least to be, you know, trusted, whatever. He, he felt pretty small. Peter felt pretty small, too. But anyways, um, I felt very much like a stranger. This was before I knew Christ and was walking with him. You know, before I became a soldier of light, I was a soldier of darkness, believe it or not. But it was back in the summer of 81. I had gone with my brother south of the border, into Mexico, into Nogales. You know anything about Nogales? Uh, Edith is looking at me, rolling her eyes. She, she's probably been there. Uh, you know, we went south of the border in Nogales for fun, for a day. And, um, wow, culture shock. I mean, I, I had been a party lifestyle person, but I went into Nogales, it was a whole new level. And we drove through Las Vegas that same summer, so I was feeling very much like a stranger in those places, even though I wasn't walking with the Lord or born again. So I won't go into an ugly story, but, you know, walking that dusty town of Nogales, you know, the, it was a tourist trap with con artists in every booth where they're selling trinkets and blankets and knives. 
There was saloons. There was brothels. There was prostitutes walking the street who were very proactive, mind you. What scared me the most was the police officers. Now, I love police officers. I have them in my family. We need to support and fund and respect police officers to the hills. But when I saw these guys, <laughs> they had uniforms, uh, but they were all wearing black glasses, sunglasses, and they were standing in pairs about every other corner, and they were watching all the tourists, watching all the activity, and they just had a scary vibe about them. It looked like the mafia. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm just a punk. I'm just 20 years old with my brother walking the streets of Nogales. We, we should not have been there. It was bad. You know, I think some people don't make it out of that city. You know, I think we're more danger than we realize. But anyways, long story short, we spent the day there. I felt, even as an unbeliever, I felt out of place. I felt like a stranger. I felt like an alien. And when we crossed back over the border, whew, I was relieved. <laughs> I was so relieved. And, uh, you know, I got the same feeling when we drove through Vegas and spent the night there. This was back in 81, the Vegas Strip. Same thing. Bars and saloons and gambling joints and police and prostitutes walking the street were very proactive. So why do I say that story? Because the way that I felt that summer, the way I felt those days, I think is the sentiment of the Apostle Peter through the Holy Spirit talking to believers in the world. You should feel like that. You should feel like a stranger here, like you're in exile. You don't belong here. We get so comfortable in America. You know, it's just, it's just so easy. Now it's getting more uncomfortable because of things going on. But, you know, here a lot of us are shielded from the bad vibes I just talked about. But I think as you grow as a Christian and read the Word of God and attend to the assembly of God and get involved in actually following and serving the Lord Jesus, and not just checking the box and complaining once in a while, but you're actually engaged in the kingdom work, you begin to realize that this world is not what it seems. And it is lying to you in a lot of different ways. You know, the kingdom of darkness, the enemy, Lucifer, and his fallen dominions who are, by the way, here. A lot of churches don't realize that. They're here. You know, Jesus, when he got out with his disciples from the Passover feast and began to, before they sang a hymn and went up to the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, let us go because the prince of this world is on his way through Judas. What do you think stirred up that crowd that crucified him? What do you think stirred up the thugs that came with torches and clubs to take Jesus away? What do you think stirred them all up to hate Jesus? What does the scripture say? They hated me without a cause. What do you think stirred them up to hate Jesus? The enemy? You say, we're spiritual warfare. There it is, right in the Gospels, in the life and times of Jesus. It 
whether it's religious people or pagan people, hey, if you follow Christ, you're like a stranger in this world because God has elected you and chosen you to be his own son and daughter. And I have to say this, you got to get used to people not liking you. You just got to get used to it. This world does not like you or call you a friend. As a matter of fact, the apostles say, don't, John, in his first letter, the apostle John says, don't make the world your friend because they're not. And so it's weird how people hate the followers of Jesus for really no reason. You know, it's not like I ran over their dog or I spilled the casserole on the white carpet. You know, I, I was just a nice guy trying to make inroads into my new family. So um, Peter is bringing up the sentiment to the believers he just visited. He's saying, look, you've been elected by God, you've been chosen out of this dark world, you, you're scattered throughout the world, and you need to remember that you're a stranger and an alien here, and feel the way that a believer should feel in the world. And if you don't feel that way, you need to draw close to the Lord. You need to open up the Bible. You need to attend church. You need to begin to experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your heart and mind, so that you do feel that way. Because if you feel comfortable with this place, like, you know, you go spend a weekend in Vegas and you're all happy about it, that's not good. That's not good. So, another thing that Peter says, I, wanna, I wanted to point out two words. Stranger. Do you feel strange here? Are you, are you treated in a strange way? It's because you're elect. It's because you're chosen. Because you're different. You're chosen to be what? Holy. What's holy mean? Different. God is different in this world. He's whole. He's perfect. He's righteous. He's holy. He's eternal. He's powerful. He's sovereign. He's majestic. He's creator. He's different. And we need to be different. Different in this world. Now, the two words I wanted to focus on was stranger. And then also, Peter brings up this other big idea. He says, you've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ because you've been sprinkled with his blood. Wow. A ton of power-packed theology into one sentence. Way to go, Peter. Man, he's got theology down now. In one sentence, he talks about the foreknowledge of God electing you to salvation He's working with you through the Holy Spirit to sanctify you and make you different, make you a stranger here. And the whole thing is about what? Obedience. Obedience. Obedience to Jesus Christ. That's what this is about. What do you mean, Pastor? Obey what? Have you read what Jesus said? He commands you to love one another. He commands you to forgive one another. If you, this is Jesus' words, now it's quoted. I'm a quotesman now here in, is that a word, quotesman? Here in 2022, I, I'm a, quote, a quotes person for him, spokesman for him. He said, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart, then neither will I forgive you before my father. Wow. That's a heavy lay down statement to get people's attention. That should convict you and say, Man, do I got unforgiveness or hatred in my heart? If I do, that's a real problem. And I need to deal with it. I need to receive the forgiveness God has for me. And when you receive that forgiveness because you're a wretched, dirty, pitiful sinner, when you know that and receive that, you can't help but forgive other people. To hold a grudge is ludicrous to Jesus. So, Jesus let all the blood run out of his body on a wooden beam by the garbage dump outside the wall of Jerusalem to forgive you and now you're going to say well I'm not forgiving them because you know what they did and it's too hard and you know it's different for me Jesus it's different for me what they did to me it's different no no it's not different because what they did to Jesus, they did to a just man. He was treated unjustly. So if you're saying, well, I don't forgive because it was unjust. You know what, I'm, I'm a good person. What they did was despicable. 
You know what? Maybe you are a good person, better than them. Maybe what they did is despicable, but you still have to forgive them. That's what it means to be different in this world. You still have to forgive because Jesus sprinkled you with his blood. Sprinkled you with his blood. Before I talk about foreknowledge for a minute, I want to talk about sprinkled with the blood for a minute. You know where Peter gets this? He read, some, he read the Bible. He read about the people of Israel being delivered from Egypt. He read about Moses and the nation of Israel fleeing Egypt and wandering into the wilderness. He read about them building the tabernacle and building the altar where they would sacrifice lambs and rams and goats and bulls. And it was a bloody place, by the way. You know when priests attended the altar? They were soaked in blood. Why do you think they had the big bronze basin? It was like a giant wash bowl. You ever think about these things? So, Peter knows the story, and Peter knows Moses, the great shepherd, took a branch of hyssop and dipped it in the blood, got it soaked in with the blood, and then sprinkled the articles in the tabernacle, then sprinkled the people with the blood of the lamb. That's what Peter's saying. You're sprinkled with the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, God's own Son. That should cause you to be different, to be a stranger in this world. He talks about foreknowledge. This is really a huge concept. Um, but as I read about it, what Peter's saying is simply this. In God's foreknowledge, he elected you. In his foreknowledge, he chose you to be in Christ. Paul says, Ephesians 1, the same thing, before the foundation of the world was made. You know what? And I'm just going to read that for a minute, because you've got to hear Paul. Listen to what he says. This is important for you to know. Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Holy, different. Blameless, because we're so good? No, because we're sprinkled with the blood of Christ. So when God the Father sees us, we are righteous because of his righteousness. That's good theology. You need to know. It goes on to say that Shows to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters in Christ. Why would God do this? Because he loved us. And he adopted us into his family. And he cleansed us with the blood of Christ. That's why Peter starts off by saying all this. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know what's happened to you? You've been chosen and elected before the foundation of the world. You've been sprinkled with the blood of Christ and therefore you're sanctified, holy, pure, blameless before the throne of God. Because if you go stand before the throne of God and you're not sprinkled with the blood, you are in a world of trouble that I can't even begin to describe to you. And you know what? Apostles talk about it. Jesus talked about it. I'm, I'm a spokesman in 2022. I, I'm talking about it. Okay? If you don't have the blood of Christ, you're in a world of hurt, my friend. You need to know Christ as your Savior. Because if you're not saved from the destruction and death and hell to come, then you are going to go there. You don't want to go there. I read the descriptions. Not good. If I can scare you into heaven, I will scare you into heaven. <laughs> now, it's not me who does the saving. I'm the spokesman for salvation. It's Jesus who does the saving. Let me make that clear. It's the blood, the cross, the resurrection. Jesus alone does the saving. I'm just telling you where to go. Go to Jesus. Jesus said, <clears throat> they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place. It'll be a lake of fire where the flame never goes out. 
And then Jesus said another, he said four commentaries. The fourth commentary said, and I, I thought about it for the longest time. I didn't know what it meant. I know what it means now. He said, where the fire will not go out and the worm will not die. Why would he say the worm will not die? There's people there. There's even worms there. It's hot. It's dark. And guess what? You're stuck there and you don't die. That's why he said that. That would have got people to think, right? I mean, if Jesus is preaching this way, why shouldn't pastors preach this way? I remember when I was a boy, you know, my dad taking me to church all the time. And uh, one time he um, couldn't find me. He was in Detroit. I was like five. I was like two miles away somewhere. He, he drives around. He finds me. He says, we're late for church. We go to church on a Sunday night. I'm so filthy and smelly. He says, Troy, go down to the basement and stay there until we leave, then I'll take you home. And in the basement, they had speakers so I could hear the sermon. The past, the guest, that wasn't my dad preaching, it was someone else. The guest pastor that night preached about the reality of hell. Oh. It got my attention. As a five, six-year-old boy, it got my attention. I remember going home that night and for like a, two weeks after, praying it before bed. Jesus, don't send me that. Don't send me that, please. <laughs> you know, and, and hey, Jesus is walking around. He hears this little six-year-old boy in bed saying, please don't send me to hell. Well, Jesus pays attention to that. I wish I would have paid attention to him. So the foreknowledge, you know, is, here's the thing. I'll, I'll end with this, foreknowledge. God knows. He just knows everything. So when he chose us in him and in Christ before even the world was formed, before the foundation of the world, he knew all the people he would weave together in the mother's womb. He knew all the generations, all the centuries, all the millions and millions of people. He knew it all. He knew all of you. He knit each of you together with your DNA and your cells. And of course he knows you. He knows the very, what's the scripture say? He knows the very head of the hairs on your head. He knows. He sees when you lie down and when you get up. He knows the thought before you say it. That's what the scriptures say. He knows all the hairs of your head. He knew before the, he knew you before the day you were born. So here's the thing, foreknowledge, he knows. Okay, he just knows. He knows who you are, what you are, what's going to happen to you. He knows everything. And basically, he knows who belonged to him. He knows who would choose him, given the choice, maybe. Theologians argue about how this goes down. I don't want to get in an argument. <laughs> I would just say this. God in his foreknowledge chose you because he knows. He knows you. He just knows who you are. And he decided to choose you. He decided to pick you up and said, like a marble lost on the ground, I'm keeping this one. And, and that's his prerogative. Now, so, Paul and Peter talk about the foreknowledge of God, but they don't explain it a lot, because I don't think you can explain it a lot. I wanted to start off this letter with these opening statements of Peter to let you know that you are elected, you are chosen by the foreknowledge of God. You are sprinkled with the blood of Christ, all for the purpose of obedience. That's what the Christian life is. If you think it's about anything else, you're wrong. It's not about checking the box, coasting, and being holier than thou. That's not what it's about. It's about engaging the kingdom, walking with the Lord, and loving people, and reaching the lost. And then Peter says here, because of all that truth about I mean, he just gave two sentences. Because of all that truth, this is Peter, it's great. He's come a long way, Peter. <laughs> he, uh, he's letting us know all of that in just two sentences to let us know you are strangers in this world. So don't live like you belong here. Father, we're grateful today that we can look into your word and hear the voice of Peter, hear your voice through Peter. You're reminding us of who we are, that we're sprinkled with the blood of your Son, that
that we were chosen before the foundation of the world, that we're elected, we're adopted, we're different. Help us to live differently in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your patience this morning. Let's bow with just one more moment added to these sacred moments here at God's house. I want to provide just a quiet moment for you to pray in your heart and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be saved. My prayer and hope, all of our prayer and hope is that you know the Lord is your Savior and friend, the one who will sprinkle you with his blood and make you clean from all your sins. It doesn't matter what you've done. He'll make you clean. And I hope that you are trusting in him and in his blood for forgiveness and for eternal life. If you've not done that, just take a moment. Just take a moment right where you're standing and say yes to God the Father and his provision of Jesus. Thank you, everyone. You may be dismissed.